All right, so what should the White House and the rest of America be prepared for when this report lands Thursday? We've got two top legal experts to help answer the questions. Former Watergate prosecutor John Sale and former independent counsel Ken Starr. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Judge, I'd like to start with you uh, because I know that you think that the Attorney General should actually stand up make a have a press conference or make a presentation have uh, deputy attorney general rod rosen sign with him and robert Mueller. any odds that he does something like that why do you think it would be helpful <laughs> hey i'm not a gambling uh, person shannon but uh, i'll tell you this uh, control the field of play uh, go on offense uh, bill barr has been handling this beautifully he's been going by the books he's abided by the regulations he's under this constant criticism which is unfair because he is obligated to redact uh, this mm -hmm. grand jury information national security information so so very briefly we're about to enter a period of enormous frustration and acrimony why was this redacted okay there's an explanation here i don't like that explanation i think it would be helpful in terms of public education and confidence in the administration of justice for the attorney general who's very able very honest simply to explain stand in the great hall of the justice department and say here's what i did here's the process we went through i think it would be very helpful all right well, we know one of the things that people are going to spar about no matter what this report says is this determination by the attorney general and rod rosenstein he says made together and with others within the justice department that there wasn't an obstruction case now, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, where impeachment, uh, ironically, would actually start, Jerry Nadler has this to say about getting that information. Mueller decided not to prosecute for obstruction of justice for various reasons, that there wasn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt of some things, but there still may have been proof of some very bad deeds and uh, very bad motives, and we need to see that, and the public needs to see that. Yeah, John, it seems like on that, that specific issue of obstruction that both sides are going to run with whatever they find there because the determination wasn't made by the special prosecutor himself. Well, I agree with Ken Starr, Judge Starr, no, that, that the criticism of the Attorney General was completely unfair. Uh, he is doing exactly what the law requires. I mean, it's a media circus. The Attorney General, the, the TV cameras are following him when he leaves his house in the morning. Uh, he's being criticized, he's being called a lackey for the president. He's going to follow his oath. He cannot release an unredacted version. Mm -hmm. The law would not permit it. He cannot release grand jury testimony. It is prohibited. But I think he's throwing an olive branch to the Congress. He said he'll try and work with them. He said he'll meet with the respective chairs mm -hmm. of the committees and he'll see what he can work out. And I think on Thursday, frankly, we could have a much different discussion. But now, I think we should just anticipate the Attorney General will be as transparent as possible, like he said, but subject to the law. Mm -hmm. And that's what his oath requires him to do. Well, Congressman Adam Schiff, who chairs the House Intelligence Committee, a Democrat, says this. He tweeted a couple of days ago, if Barr and Rosenstein redact Mueller's report for Congress, it will be by choice, not legal compulsion. Rosenstein chose to give a GOP House nearly a million pages of discovery in Clinton and Russia probe, but they chose not to give 400 pages of Trump-related info to a Dem House. Now, Judge, I mean, that you know, people could argue about whether that is um, disingenuous or not, because... Certainly, the chairman knows that not everything can be thrown into the public sphere. I think that's exactly right. It's very unfortunate that this, but it's inevitable, this becomes so politicized. And Shannon, I think one of the takeaways here is why did we have a special counsel using a grand jury and shrouded in secrecy as it has to be to make this inquiry in the first place? Uh, we're reaping a very bitter harvest right now. Why didn't we follow uh, the Senate Select Committee and Watergate example? Why didn't we follow the 9-11 Commission? And I'm not talking about obstruction. I'm talking the alleged uh, obstruction. I'm talking about whether, in fact, there was collusion. The American people deserved and the president deserved uh, to know a year ago, 18 months ago, the answer to that basic fundamental question. Obstruction is derivative from this. And by the way, one person's view, I can't even understand the obstruction argument. There was no firing of Bob Mueller. There was no sealing off of his offices. That happened in Watergate. There was complete, as far as we know, cooperation with the investigation. 
uh, thousands of documents turned over to the investigation. The counsel to the president testified for 30 hours. This is honestly unheard of. So there was not only not obstruction, as I see it, given what we know, mm -hmm. uh, there was the antithesis obstruction. It was complete cooperation. Lots of nasty language, but cooperation. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see, all of us, on Thursday morning as this goes not only to Congress, but it goes public as well. Thank you both for helping us to have a preview tonight. Thank you. The Justice Department set to release on Thursday morning Special Counsel Robert Mueller's much-anticipated and redacted Russia report to the public and Congress. Former federal prosecutor Doug Burns joining us now for details on, Doug, particularly what we can expect, particularly whether the substance of the full Mueller report will basically mirror what the Barr memo said. Well, the Barr memo was a summary of the ultimate conclusions on the main issues, uh, i.e., you know, obstruction of justice, working backwards, and collusion. He said that the report itself made it clear that there was not a lot of evidence developed to support the idea that there was any criminal collusion. On obstruction, it was a little more in the weeds. He said it was kind of debatable legally and factually, and we're going to have main justice. My theory on that is that they probably tapped into the Office of Legal Counsel, very academic wing of DOJ to analyze this. And you heard a lot of experts saying, just because you say, can you see your way clear to dropping a case, that's not obstruction of justice automatically. Right. I know those sounds like sound bites. But the point is, now you're going to see, and one of my friends put it well, you're going to see like a prosecution memo, albeit much, much longer. And they're going to go through who was charged, what was the evidence. They did 500 warrants. They did 2,000 subpoenas. Mm -hmm. They did 500 witness interviews. And they're going to be summaries of all of that. Now, that's legal. When you translate it into political, it's a whole different discussion because it's universally DOJ policy. It's so interesting that if a case is declined, you don't then start getting into details um, of the facts. But there's two problems with that. Problem number one, James Comey. That's exactly what he did with Hillary Clinton. And so it's a political payback concept. You threw her under the bus. You talked all about what she did wrong. Well, now we want that in reverse, okay? Uh, so you do get that. And point number two, of course, is politics and impeachment in a regular criminal case. If you assume for the sake of argument you don't have that in play, hey, the case is declined. That's the end of the mm -hmm. discussion. But here, no, no, no. Everybody's thirsting for potential yes. impeachment material, David. You just talked about legally, Doug. And so if we're sure. Talking about legally, there's no collusion with Russians. However, in 2016, there were a lot of Trump associates right. that were in contact with Russia. Right. So I could assume that politically, that's going to rile a lot of people up. So do you believe that that can change anything, as well as the subpoena that's from a, Democrats? That's a, great, that's a great point, and here's why that's a great point, because you have the difference between law and semantics, okay? Mm -hmm. Legally, the question is, is there criminal conduct? Do you have the level of intent required for a crime? When you sort of politicize uh, or criminalize politics, sorry, I had it backwards, criminalize politics, you've heard Professor Dershowitz talk about this a lot, you know, when you criminalize politics, what happens is you just effortlessly shift from pure criminal analysis mm -hmm. to semantics. He met a Russian guy implying that there's something wrong with that. I was in a courtroom one time, I'll never forget it. They said, Mr. X came out of his home, he egressed the building, he looked around, he got in his vehicle. I stood up in the summation, I said, he came out of his house, ladies and gentlemen, and he got <laughs> in his car. Yeah. No, and I never forget that. Because the point is you can make things sound criminal that aren't, okay? But Lawyers. would that be the purpose of this memo, I mean, and the, of this report, and more importantly, are we going to really learn a lot that we don't already know from all the hysterical reporting that's gone on over the last two years? No, it's really fascinating, Liz, because it's really either going to be a big letdown, you know, from a political standpoint, right. which is that it'll be mostly about the 13 Russians who were indicted right. and, and all of that and, you know, the whole Manafort case, you know, for 100 pages. We'll see. Or there'll be something that they can latch on to. But your point is very well taken, which is it may not be that there's anything all that new that's emerging from this but again broken record it's more political than it is legal okay uh, in Doug, my view. The, the, the word redaction I've heard that about several million times over the past few <laughs> yes. weeks and I think a few thousand times out what should or could be redacted can you give us the rules of the road on this on uh, redaction of security what what needs to be and can the Democrats actually uh, make them re uh, 
put everything out there regardless whether it should be redacted or not? No, that's fascinating. And the reason that's fascinating is because when Congress called for the complete report unredacted, as well as the supporting, you know, 302s, memos of interviews with witnesses, the point is you can't do that because you'd be asking them to ostensibly violate rules and sure. laws uh, and commit a crime. So let me break down the answer to your question. You've heard other pundits, legal experts say there are four categories of material that one has to go through with a fine tooth comb. The big one is Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure says you can't disseminate or disclose grand jury material without an order from a court. Okay, There are some exceptions in there in fairness, but for the most part that's a big, big one. Next. Uh, classified information, because don't forget, this started ostensibly, the big argument is, as a counterintelligence probe. So you have that. Next is, um, you know, material that could impact ongoing investigations in the day-to-day -day practice of federal criminal law. We're in courtrooms all the time, and the government relies on that. Some sometimes legit, sometimes a little too aggressively. Your Honor, that would right. impact an ongoing case we're doing. Okay, and those are the principal categories. Doug, to answer I, your question. I need to just switch gears really quickly. So President Trump doubling down on his threat to send illegal immigrants to sanctuary cities, tweeting this today. Quote, those illegal immigrants who can no longer be legally held, Congress must fix the laws and loopholes, will be subject to homeland security given to sanctuary cities and states. Can he legally do this? Again, I really sound like a broken record, but Liz made this point when we were chatting about this. This is really political, and the point is, out of anger um, for those politicians who said, we embrace, you know, having as many aliens here as possible. So President Trump, to be sarcastic politically, said, oh, you embrace it? Well, we're going to send all of them to you. The so point it's political. is, first, the crystal ball, he's never going to do it. But then on the pure legality of it, I talked to a number of experts this afternoon. I was trying to gauge this. Mm -hmm. It's not 100 percent clear. I mean, there's nothing thing that prohibits the president from selecting a jurisdiction and saying, you know what, in my executive discretion, I want to send these people to that jurisdiction. And one of my friends, an expert, uh, who tends to be liberal politically, put that to the side, said, Doug, I see nothing that would prevent him from doing so it. Actually, that was it doesn't, okay. doesn't it come down like Sorry. the wall? Quickly, quick it comes last down question. to money, I think, and being money not being available for that, just like the wall. No, I agree with that. Right. Absolutely right. Doug Burns, great to see you, my friend. We could Thank spend you. an hour doing yeah. this. Thank you very Seminar, much. Right?